welcome our other panelists for the next part of this conversation. Carrie McDonough, who is a PhD student here at GSO. Of course, Andrew David Thaler, and Chris Fazy from Harvard, an astrophysicist or astrophysics PhD student there. And um, we'd like to start by having both Carrie and Chris describe briefly their blogs, and then we'll get into um, the question of how they got started doing this blogging thing. And this is supposed to be a very interactive sort of Q&A sort of thing. So you can jump in with your questions after they give their intros. And Carrie, you can start. OK. Um, so I'm a PhD student uh, here at GSO. Just finished my second year. Um, and I study environmental chemistry and marine pollution. So kind of intertwined in the research I do is the importance of science communication um, kind of from the offset, because there's a lot of policy and public health involved in that. So I think that's kind of why I got involved and interested in science communication in the first place. Um, because of that interest, I went to the Communicating Science Conference, ComSciCon, um, after my first year of my PhD. I went to that conference where I met Chris and a bunch of the other um, Astrobytes organizers. Um, and inspired by that experience, I started a blog um, here at GSO called Ocean Bites, kind of based off of the Astro Bites model, which you'll hear Chris talk about. Um, so what we do, basically, we're a grad student run blog. Um, our target audience would be kind of undergraduates and uh, other people with kind of an interest in science and some science education who are not PhD students in the marine sciences. Um, so people who are interested in science but maybe don't want to go read that whole journal article, you know, but they want to get um, some of the details. Um, so we write for kind of that audience. We have uh, 13 writers right now, um, all grad students, and I've really been floored by the amount of enthusiasm we've had for this project. We started in September and immediately had, I think, 10 writers. Um, we post pretty much every other day, um, and we edit each other's posts. So. Each month you have a date where you write, and then you have a date where you edit for someone else. Um, so it's kind of a project that's supposed to help grad students um, communicate about science better uh, and improve their writing skills. Um, I've seen, even in the short time I've been doing it, I think I've gotten a lot faster at writing um, about other people's research uh, in a way that's accessible. Um, so it's been a really great exercise in that way. Um, we're still very new, we're not even a year old yet. So I think some of the things we're struggling with now would be, um, as we were discussing the comments earlier, we don't really have that interaction yet with our audience. Um, so kind of trying to spark more conversation on the website um, and also define our audience better and better and kind of understand them and what they want to be reading about. Um, so yeah. If you're interested in hearing more about Ocean Bites, you can find me later. OK, so I'm Chris Fazy, and I'm just finishing my third year of the PhD program in astrophysics at Harvard. Uh, and I'll just say three words about my research, which is that I study how stars are born, stars like our own sun. It's a very important origin story. Um, and similar to the life cycles that go on on the planet Earth, there is a life cycle of stars and gas in the universe. And it's really important to understand uh, how that works, to understand how we all got here. Um, I'm also an author for Astrobytes, but it is, I, I need to point out, it is not my blog, actually. Mm -hmm. There are over 50 graduate students now in astronomy around the world that have been involved in Astrobytes. Uh, it was founded by five graduate students, not including me, at Harvard in December of 2010. So we've been around for about three and a half years. Uh, and I jumped on board right when I started uh, the PhD program there because I saw right away how uh, amazing it was. And I've been a part ever since and have been a, a writer and now an administrator of Astrobytes since then. So Astrobytes operates similarly to Ocean Bytes, um, but unlike some of the other blogs uh, like Andrew's, we actually have a very specific mission. We were formed. Uh, with the specific goal of helping undergraduates uh, who are interested in astronomy gain access to the research, which uh, upon first look appears to be written in a different language sometimes with all the jargon and the acronyms. And uh, it was sort of founded, the, the founder, Nathan Sanders, told me, and I'll, I'll always remember, he was sitting in his office 
in the fall of his first year of graduate school, complaining to his office mate about how his new advisor had just told him to go read this stack of papers. Like, yeah, I'm interested in supernovae. And the advisor says, okay, well, go read these papers and then come back and we'll talk about your project. And so he picks up the papers and in the abstract alone, he has to start looking up words. He just doesn't understand anything about it. He said, I wish there was this service out there that could translate articles in my field into, into plain English so I could get started uh, with research uh, a little more accessibly. And his office mate said, well, you should start it. It doesn't exist yet. Oh, that's a really good idea. And so they did. And the five graduate students at Harvard decided they would each start writing one post per week about a research paper, a journal article, um, one that was posted on our free preprint server. And I don't know if uh, your fields have this or not, but in astronomy there's uh, something called the archive, which is just somewhere where scientists put their articles, either before or after peer review, it doesn't matter, anybody can put one up. Um, but it's very common in our field, everybody puts them there, so it's, and it's something anyone can access, it's, it's paid free, which is really important. Um, so one article per day, and each of these original five brave members of Astrobytes wrote once a week, which is a huge time commitment. Um, but since then, it grew quite quickly. Um, graduate students outside Harvard became involved through the networks of the people that started it, uh, eventually growing to about 20 authors, which is where we stand right now. And so now everyone writes one article per month um, and also edits. We edit for each other in the same way that Ocean Bites does. Um, but I'd like to emphasize that it's really a group effort. I would never consider this to be my blog, even if I'm technically in charge of it at some point. Um, and that's one way to make it sustainable as a graduate student or even as someone further along in your career. You can't dedicate all your time to blogging. Um, and so you have to distribute the work. Uh, we get about 1,000 hits per day now. And that's been steady for a little over a year. And those are that's as tracked by our analytics tools. That doesn't track people that subscribe to our RSS feed, which probably is at least half of our readers. So a couple thousand a day. Um, and our articles are 600 to 800 words, so designed to be easily readable. Um, and then that's all I'll say, except that I wrote down three of those, and uh, Andrew added his <laughs> as well. Please tweet at us during the meeting and <laughs> later on. Astrobytes is, of course, the Astrobytes account. CFASI is me. Ocean Bytes is the Ocean Bytes account. And I guess we can open it up for discussion at this point. Was there anything you wanted to add along these lines? No, I think I. Uh, while we're doing that, so I wrote that, Andy didn't do that, I wrote Andy. <laughs> to get a look there, and also all of these and, and some hashtags too. So, um, question. We can start pulling more out of them as necessary. But. Okay. So you mentioned that the, when you started the blog, it started for undergrad stores in the Western mm -hmm. So how, how does it change? Or how, how does the blog serve the purpose? That's a good question. Uh, Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so he was asking how our target audience has, or the blog itself has changed since its inception. It was originally designed to be a resource for undergraduates to get in, uh, involved in research accessibly. So we started doing surveys of our readership after about a year, and we were extremely surprised, Andrew says you have surprises all the time, <laughs> that only 20% of our readers identified as undergraduates. So. Our first thought was, oh, wow, we've failed. We've totally <laughs> failed to reach the audience we want to reach. But then we realized, oh, we're actually, we've actually succeeded because we've reached more people. There is more interest for this than we originally thought. And our target audience may have been undergraduates, but our actual audience is something quite larger. And so we have to take that into consideration. So we still call ourselves a blog for undergraduates. And that is still our primary mission. And that's who we write for. Um, and I think. In doing that, we still reach the other people, which are graduate students, professors and scientists in our own field, uh, and the public and educators we found have become interested as well. So the way we do this is by taking jargon and breaking it down and defining it. Uh, every time something comes up in our post that needs to be explained a little more, it's either linked directly to a website that has full information on say, how stars are classified, for example, this thing called the HR diagram. It's total jargon if you're not in astronomy, but it's really fundamental, basic thing. And it can be explained easily in a paragraph. And so we, we link to an article that does that. Uh, or if it can be defined in a few words, we define it there. Um, but it turns out that the, the target audience and the real audience need the same things. They need accessibly explained science. And so that was 
a nice surprise to find that we were reaching more people. I would agree that chemical oceanography itself, that might not be <laughs> as much of an idea, but marine pollution and environmental chemistry, I think, you know, it's very intertwined with environmental policy and public health. Um, so that was more kind of the, the fact that that's my concentration, uh, I think brought me more into that um, realm of communicating science. Um, as far as how I got other people to write with me, um, I just sent some emails out to GSO saying that I was starting this project, um, and I got responses from people in all different fields across uh, GSO, and now we also have some people at other schools as well who are ecologists or climate scientists or modelers or, you know, all different uh, geologists, all sorts of things. Um, so I think that there's just uh, a real enthusiasm among all different kinds of graduate students for improving their communication skills and their writing skills. Um, so I really, yeah, I haven't had much trouble finding people who are enthusiastic about it. <laughs> You guys limited to grad have, have, have your writers graduated out of the program yet? Or have they and we have, yeah. In fact, our founder just graduated, and we've been trying to figure out can we can we survive without him. But luckily, we distribute our, our workloads enough that it's easy to do. Uh, for us, it's very important that this is a blog by graduate students for undergraduates. And so, at the moment, our intent is to continue forward with that same model. Everyone volunteers their time. Everyone is not so far in their career that they've forgotten what it's like to read their first research paper. And so in that way, we hope that, that our authorship serves our audience as best as possible. And it also just sounds really good when you go to a, you know, a national organization or funding agency and you say, we're a student project. They, they like to see that students are taking initiative and getting involved in communication themselves, not just uh, professors and postdocs. Same for you, Gary? Um, I think if we had limited it only to grad students, we might not have made it off the ground because a lot of our writers graduated within months of starting. Uh, so right now, I think about half of the original grad students' writing have moved on. Um, we're kind of struggling with that right now, trying to decide what defines you know who writes for Ocean Bites and when they stop writing and why. Um, so I think that that's something we're kind of trying to shape at the moment. It's kind of hard. <laughs> I'm glad to hear they're graduating from that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our founder graduated in four years. Wow. It's pretty amazing. Jeez. Oh. That is a very important question. Uh, and my short answer is we don't. Because technically anyone can post to the archive with anything they want. They could post a story about how dinosaurs uh, formed the earth out of clay if they wanted to. But we're probably not going to write about that particular article. So there's, on average, about 50 astronomy articles posted per day. And so our authors, we give them complete liberty to choose what they want. But at the same time, we all kind of have the common sense to choose something that is clearly relevant beyond the, the narrow subfield and is not complete crackpot science. But that leaves a big gray area. So I think everyone's opinion kind of varies a little bit on this. But one thing we started to do recently is we say at the top of the article what the current status of the article is in terms of uh, peer review and publishing. So. In, in astronomy, about half of the people post an article to the uh, to the archive before peer review, and the other half only post after. And that first half generally updates with the peer-reviewed article afterwards as well. So it turns out that the majority of articles on there have actually been peer-reviewed and are the identical form that will appear in the journal. And when I blog, I choose those articles almost exclusively. But for those that choose articles that come out maybe before peer review, they always acknowledge it at the top. Mr. 
this is a sort of a related question to that. So I, I work for the EPA. Um, EPA has some blogs, and of course, those blog posts that we might review don't go out without a rather significant amount of reviews. Um, so just a quick question about the three blogs. Are, are they um, independent, or are you part of it? Like, are you part of Harvard, or are you part of uh, GSO? Um, and then I think you're independent right, from, from our discussion. Is what might be some benefit, pros and cons, between being independent and being part of it? Well, for us, it's win-win. Our servers are hosted at Harvard, but we're completely independent of them. <laughs> so we kind of can do whatever we want. That said, we've had some very uh, intense discussions amongst our authorship about controversial topics and whether or not to post something. And there have been times that an article that's been written by one of our authors has sort of been uh, internally rejected, let's say. So we, we tend to be fairly conservative in terms of controversial issues uh, and posting but we essentially can do whatever we want. And we are not just independent, but also independently funded. So um, our audience, our, our regular audience, actually funds Southern Fried Science through a donation system. Um, and we, we love controversy. We dive right into the controversial topics. We, we view it as because a lot of the institutionally supported blogs can dive into controversial topics. We see it as, as part of our job to at least weigh in on disinformation that's spreading, and because um, we don't have any ties to an institution, we can do that. Verification questions. So the difference between um, things that are uncertain out there because of misinformation and uncertain in the scientific community. The scientific community is the same uncertainty about the scientific results. Right. And I don't know if you guys are talking about the same when you're saying conservative. You know, conservative scientifically or conservative publicly? So, um, I guess the example I would use is uh, my work with drones. Um, it, it's controversial in that there aren't really policies out there to regulate them uh, in specific ways. Um, we don't really know exactly what their effects are going to be. If you have armies of drones blotting out the sky staring at whales, that's probably a bad thing. But the reality of the situation on the ground is that uh, a little two kilogram quadcopter is probably far less disruptive to a gray whale than driving up to it in a skiff. Um, so on that issue, I, 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 I pulled out whatever resources were available and, and made the, uh, the best expert opinion I could, which is that the current legal status is, uh, does not reflect the on the ground reality of the drones as a less impactful way to monitor marine mammals. Um, so that's the case where the issue is, is pretty controversial. There's, there's science defending both sides. Um, but unless we start saying, look, we need to get regulators to flesh out these issues, otherwise either it's going to be a free-for-all and people will be soaring their drones around, crashing them into dolphins, or they'll be totally shut down like they are in the national parks because some guy was chasing a bighorn sheep with his. Um, so, so encouraging regulators to find that right middle ground where they can be effectively regulated and still used to the benefit of the environment. For us, I, I would say it really comes down to what you're trying to do with your blog. I think it's good to have a goal. And for us, our goal is really to inform. And so when I say we are conservative, what I mean to say is that we don't like to take a stand on uh, one side or, or another about an issue that isn't scientifically agreed upon. For example, the recent Claim detection of, of primordial gravitational waves. There's been a lot of discussion back and forth in the literature and on the archive about these results and whether there's some emission from dust in the galaxy that uh, that messed with the signal and might mean that it's not really detection after all. We realize that a lot of people come to our site and will take what they read there and that'll be as far as they go. And so we have to be careful not to put forth one side of a debated issue and not the other. So if we talk about that particular issue, we'll, we try to talk about both sides of it. Um, that said, we're not afraid to take a stand on a controversial issue that has clear scientific backing on one side. Do you guys have any policies? I mean, we only publish on peer-reviewed articles. Um, we don't, I think we try pretty hard to be very objective and just say this is what this article said um, and not take a stance, seeing as we're all just graduate students trying to learn how to write more than, you know, um, get out there and make trouble just yet. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, but um, we're not funded by anyone right now. Um, we're on our own server, so I guess we're like, we're kind of just being, yeah, scientifically conservative um, because we're all graduate students who are affiliated with institutions um, and have our own selves to represent. <laughs> Yeah, we put the citation right at the top of the article and we link to the DOI. Same here. Yeah. The beautiful thing about blogs is that you can embed hyperlinks into them. So any any fact you say, you can embed the link to your source directly into the statement. And then there's no searching around. You have to scroll down to the bottom to find it. You just click right on the link and it goes right to the original source. Yeah, one of our main goals is, especially for this target undergraduate audience, for them to read our article say, okay, I think I understand this a little bit. Now let me go look at the source itself and see if I can understand that and learn some of these strange words that I don't yet understand. In reality, we, we track that not very many people actually follow that link, but that's still our goal. <laughs> that's one of the things that drives me crazy about science news stories is at best they'll mention the name of the <laughs> author and maybe the name of the journal, but they never, never. I think that's a problem. Primary sources are still important in journalism, no matter how much it's changed. Curious about the three of you, or you and your writers, how you make transition from writing peer-reviewed articles to this sort of blog stuff for the general audience. Is there a process for learning how to do that, or just came organically in journalism? Well, I can speak for myself. I haven't taken any journalism or writing courses. I think of it as wearing two different hats, and I'll just take one off and put the other one on. But of course, it's not just that easy. You just you just have to practice and develop it over time. So I think if I went back and looked at my first attempts at, at articles, they I wouldn't think they're very good anymore. But once you do it enough and care enough about it and read other people's, and I think one very important component in this is editing other people's work. So. All the members of Astrobytes are not just writers, but editors, and we have to edit once a month for each other. And by doing that, it's really the fastest way to figure out what works and what doesn't in terms of what you're trying to do for your audience. Well, of course, you spend more time having this conversation with Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what analytics do you use to find out about your clients? Passive or active? Uh, are there any metrics that you found are particularly useful or particularly not useful? And what do you do with that information about your audience? So I use Google Analytics for a lot of what we do um, to look for things like Google Analytics will break things down by geography so you can see where in the world people are coming from. Um, it'll break things down by demographic information, um, what computers they're using, what browsers they're using. Um, and I use that primarily for server load management um, to make sure that everything is running smoothly if, if a huge number of people are uh, accessing it via their phones versus a computer we change the layout of the site to make it more smartphone accessible um, but primarily when I look at stats I'm looking at that in terms of how will this affect server load and people's ability to access the site because the amount of traffic coming in dictates how fast the site loads and whether or not it loads at all um, on a, on a broader scale, I sometimes look at link backs, look where people are clicking uh, to get an idea of what kind of content they're engaging with. But generally, I like to take a hands-off approach to sort of the stats um, and write more about what we care about and what we think is fun and interesting versus what we think is going to go viral or, you know, we don't, we try not to tailor our content to catch internet memes or anything despite me talking about catching news cycles for, for specific topics, but those are specific topics that we care about. Like, um, and then checking the stats once a month just to make sure we haven't lost all of our traffic to, to some <laughs> weird thing. Uh, we also use a lot of social metrics to look at how um, many people are talking about our stuff on uh, social media. Uh, so programs like Topsy and Radian 6 are really important for seeing how that conversation spreads through the rest of the internet. 
Uh, Topsy is um, a pretty basic software package for tracking um, conversations on Twitter. Uh, they used to have a pro package, but then Apple bought them and canceled it. Um, so it's the functionality is slowly declining. Radian 6 is like the professional social media management platform. And I, I get that through work. You, you can't. It's, it's expensive to use just on its own. So we also use Google Analytics as well as the built-in WordPress um, analysis tools. But honestly, we don't do a whole lot with the numbers other than say, OK, this many, we're reaching this many people, and this many of, us, of them stay around for more than two minutes, which is a sadly small number at this point. <laughs> Um, but I think that's just the internet, that's how it works. Uh, the types of information we do use are, are surveys, and we found that to be extraordinarily helpful, um, both in understanding who our readers are, but also what they're interested in reading about. So in addition to posting these articles about uh, astronomy journal papers, we also like to write and have found it's actually more popular to write about uh, advice and careers in astronomy or practical things like how to run your own simulation of the universe, or how to download a particular software package, or um, talk about conferences that we go to, like the Communicating Science Conference that several of us were in, um, coding issues, just all kinds of things that anybody in the field might identify with and find uh, an interesting read. So it was thanks to surveys that we learned that our audiences actually were um, just as, if not more, interested in these topics um, as the academic part. Yeah, just Google surveys that are voluntarily filled out. So, I mean, there could be biases uh, in terms of our responses, of course. But we typically get on the order of 200 to 300 responses to our surveys. So hopefully it's somewhat representative. At least the people that care enough to fill out the survey are getting what they want. How often do you do the surveys? Once a year, typically. Yeah. So how much of the content is now is how-to rather than blogging about an article? It's still majority article, and we maintain the format of one article per weekday. And those additional um, posts happen either when someone can't find an article they want, or they just went to a conference and they really want to talk about it, or on the weekends. So I'd say it's probably 60 to 80% um, articles and the rest uh, supplemental. Do you have any um, underrated instructors that Anecdotally, yes. We've had people, especially at meetings, come up to us and say, we love your site. It's been an excellent resource. We even had somebody come up and say, we have a high school class in physics, and we've pointed them to your site, and they've done a two-week project where they write their own summary, which is a level below the Astrobyte summary, which is a level below the journal article. Um, and we actually wrote uh, a paper for Astronomy Education Review Journal on using Astrobytes in the classroom, and we did some test cases with some professors. So that article is available online, and you can you can read about um, what we've done. My opinion is it hasn't been as uh, broadly successful as I had hoped, but we may just not be hearing the stories. Um, but I think it, you know, a model like Astrobytes or Ocean Bytes lends itself directly to undergraduate education. Yeah, I would love to have more of that happen. I mean, we're pretty young, so I haven't heard about any of that yet, but it would be a great way to get it out there, for sure. And as far as our analytics go, we also use Google Analytics. Um, and I think it is a really difficult question of, I mean, you can see what's happening, and you can see kind of your stats, but what to do about it is like a whole other question that we're kind of struggling with now. Um, you know, when people only stay on the site for a minute and a half, what does that mean? <laughs> and how do you change that? Um, so I think that's something that we're, we're actively working on. Um, one of the interesting things we have learned is kind of similar to what you were saying, posts about, uh, we had one post about making your own pH meter um, and other posts about things like, hey, you scientists are using muscles to clean water, things like that, uh, where people are using, using tools or doing DIY things are the most popular posts, which is interesting. I didn't, didn't see that coming. People love how-tos. Yeah. It's just, they do. That's like, <laughs> if you care about search engine optimization, which you shouldn't, um, Starting an article with how to is a great way to drive traffic. <laughs> um, yeah, and we did, um, we coordinated a survey in 2011 um, across the broader ocean blogging community. 
um, to kind of get an idea of what kinds of people are reading ocean science blogs in general. Uh, and it was uh, predominantly grad student uh, and PhD level audience, at least the ones who responded to the survey, uh, which was interesting to see. So it was reaching a much higher audience, with the exception of the shark posts, which were primarily high schoolers. <laughs> Uh, less often than I would expect, but sometimes yes, and it's been almost universally positive, and thank you for writing about my work, and you really explained it well. I couldn't have explained it this well myself to a public audience. Occasionally we'll get a small clarification, like, oh, you said this, and this is really what we mean, and that goes in the comments, and so the, the readers get to see it. Um, so you know, we welcome any feedback that we get. Uh, we often get feedback. We also often reach out before we write it to the authors and be like, hey, this is really cool. We want to write about it. Is there anything more you want us to, to add? So we usually start that dialogue even before we publish it. Um, and that ends up building some very productive uh, relationships as well. Yeah. And we, we have a we have a hands-off policy for bad science. So we only write about papers we like. We don't write about papers we don't think are very good. Same here. Though, that is not to say that we write about all papers we like. So if we haven't written about your paper, that should not <laughs> reflect at all upon anything other than we haven't had a chance to write about it. Um, yeah, I mean, we also write about papers we like. We're not writing from a critical standpoint, you know? So you want to pick something that, that you have positive feelings about. I mean, we have heard back from a couple authors, and it's all been very positive. They usually seem pretty excited. <laughs> I was going to ask you guys, um, particularly the student-run blogs, if there's been any discussion about sort of um, including human interest stories, either about sort of you know, the New York Times might have just been a work model or you know, short features on, on students that are actually doing the science to sort of add more of a kind of human interest dimension. And, and, I, and I would think that that would connect well with undergraduates wondering, wow, these guys are getting you know, have this blog, they're writing about research in ocean sciences, how did they get there, and what was their usual path, and I'm wondering if you guys have thought about including anything along those lines, or if it's just sort of too off topic. Absolutely. Um, we actually had something, we've had a couple ideas that we've taken a stab at, and I think the only problem right now is finding someone to spearhead it, because we're all kind of at capacity, like even just writing one post a month is like, you know, like <laughs> putting, getting someone to do more than that um, can be difficult. So getting something like that off the ground um, hasn't happened yet, but we do have ideas for doing something like um, interview with a grad student that comes out every once in a while, or interview with a PI and like what's your normal daily work like, um, things like that. Um, we also have a new feature that should be starting, which is going to be reviews of marine science and popular media that will kind of bring it um, a little bit more into uh, different readership, I think. So yeah, we're, we're heading towards that, I think. It just takes a long time to get it organized. I think that's a really important thing to include on a blog, even one that has the goal of education or, or explanation. And we have a whole section that we call personal experiences, which has included a number of uh, these types of things, such as, so we had one author that was in research and switched to education. And so she wrote an article, a very heartfelt article, on why I left research for education, and I think that was one of our most popular articles. Um, there was also uh, a letter in our community that was written by a faculty member at an unnamed institution that talked about how things were much harder in his or her day and they worked 100 hours a week and basically <laughs> saying how grad students uh, should do nothing else besides work. And it's this, it's this feeling that we've all had as graduate students where I'm not working hard enough. And, so this came out from you know a top level person and it sort of incited a fire in the community about well how long do people actually work and what are the expectations and what's going on in the lives of graduate students and so we wrote about this uh, and it was I think next to the one that accidentally made it onto Reddit and got like 60,000 hits this was the article that had the most hits we did a follow up survey of our readers twice as many answered that survey as answered our readership survey. So that was a human interest story that, uh, that got a lot of attention. 
Um, and then finally, profiles of graduate students. This is something we're just starting now for retiring authors. We're doing a little profile of them. Mm. This person wrote, wrote for Astrobytes for two years. This is what they do. Here's something about their daily life. That's mm. really cool. Yeah, and we will do, we, we love like field work stories. Ours are fantastic. Um, we'll have, when we go out in the field, we kind of um, relax the, the formality of the posts and, and, and let our, our authors who are in the field conducting field work in the moment write more personal, like, this is what we're doing today. This is really cool. This is what we discovered. Because we think that sort of, that kind of immediate connection to another person is really important for getting people to uh, care about science. I, because we're almost, well, we get 10 more minutes here, but um, I want to be sure to ask, especially the grad students on the panel, and Andy, you can say, you can talk about this when you were a student too, how you manage all of these different things. So you talk a little bit about the fact that you limit it to one post a month for students, and that's great, but obviously some of you are going to hear from your, your advisors, why are you doing this, <laughs> um, why are you doing research, and I want to know how you manage this. I've never heard that from my advisor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's just, it's a lot of work. Um, especially at first, before before you're just writing the one post a month, you have to get the site off the ground. Someone has to design the site. Someone has to recruit the writers. Someone has to make the schedule every month and bug people to write if they're not writing. And it can be a ton of work. Um, and I think part of that is just finding other people who are enthusiastic and delegating those tasks. You really can't do it alone if you want to have something that you're going to write, you know, and have consistent content. Um, this never would have worked. I think even with three people, it would have been almost impossible. But since we had 10, like it, it worked out. Um, but yeah, I mean, there was a while there where I would say I was putting a lot of time into it, maybe a little more than I would have loved to. But I thought it was a really, really good idea. And I thought it needed to be done. So I thought it was important enough to do that, so you just kind of have to make that call, I guess. Okay, so let's see, I'll, I'll hit on two points. One is the advisor point, and so I guess at Harvard, uh, we're really lucky that our department is extremely supportive of what we do. Um, they see Astrobytes as being tied to Harvard since it was founded there, it reflects well on them. Um, but of course, not every advisor is going to agree that spending even one day a month on something like this is a worthwhile use of time when you could be uh, making more results and writing more papers. Um, so that's hard to combat, and it's a big question. I think the long answer is that the world of science is changing, and I think that there's more recognition for the importance of communication, and that it's not time wasted, but that it's an investment in your own ability to talk to not just the public about science, which you know you could have a full day or full week session on why that's important and how you can do it better but also with your peers. If you can explain science cogently to the public, you can explain it clearly to people that are in your field. And there's so much misunderstanding that even occurs between scientists who know the same jargon. Uh, any effort spent on improving communication is worthwhile. And I would, my, my advice to graduate students who have a, a difficult advisor is, try to explain passionately why you think this is important. See if you can convince them through communication why communication is important, why spending time on communication is important. It's worth the investment. And if you can't get them to see things your way, maybe it's worth finding a new advisor if you can, or <laughs> not telling them about it. It's, I mean, it really is worth it, and you have to believe that. That's all I can say, I guess. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll totally second that. Um, first off, I just add that, I mean, time management is time management. Science blogging is, is, is not fundamentally different from anything else that might occupy your time. So developing good time management skills as a graduate student is, critical regardless of what your other activities are beyond the uh, bench work. Um, but becoming a better writer makes you a better scientist. It, it helps with clarity of thinking. Uh, it helps with the ability to get words on the page. It helps being able to write faster. So um, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that um, the, the first three authors of Southern Fried Science, when it was just a three-person show, had the uh, highest publication rates of our lab groups um, in, in all different labs. Um, it's because when you are constantly thinking about writing and working on your writing, <clears throat> you become a better writer. And being a better writer benefits your scientific writing. It benefits your public outreach writing. It benefits your ability to communicate with your advisor clearly and cogently. Um, so I think these are all skills that are um, 
translational across multiple disciplines and multiple needs. It's not just, I'm science blogging, therefore I'm not doing bench work or science. I'm science blogging as part of my career development. I think also um, when people say, you know, you should dedicate all your time to your research. If you dedicate all of your time to your research, some of that time is going to be spent just staring at the wall because you're going to be completely like fried out of your mind. You're like, you're not going to be able to do it anymore. So I think a lot of the time that I spend writing or working on ocean bites isn't really time when I would have been doing research otherwise. It's time that I need to take off. And if I weren't doing that writing, I would be, I don't know, doing something else to kind of relax or exercise my brain in a different way. So it's just a nice way to get some diversity in your, in your day. I guess I can make one more comment about starting a blog and time management. Uh, like we've all said, it's really a big team effort, but the size of the team is less important than who those people are. I think with at least five and up to 20 people, if everybody is really on the same page and committed to, to putting in their share of the effort, then you're gonna succeed. The getting started part is the hardest, and you just wanna make sure you have those people. And if you have some people that aren't, you can tell aren't gonna be as dedicated, just cut down the number and post half as often. You're gonna be much more successful with everybody on the same page and having a goal that's, that's shared between you than if you have a bunch of people who are sort of, oh, maybe I'm interested. Um, that's probably the hardest part is getting started. Thank you for that. I would say, I would say the critical goal is to turn the entire public into into you. Yes. <laughs> because they're not. Let's face it. They're not all there yet, and thanks to you, some of them are getting there. So it's really it's a partnership. So uh, one last question. You have to go to them. You track down people. You start conversations. You send emails to mainstream media sources. You know, if you think you've got something that you want to reach a very broad audience, you email someone at CNN and say, "Hey, take a look at this," um, and just keep doing that until they'll they pick it up. Um, it's a slow process um, until you get to that point where there's people monitoring you for more content. Um, but there are, I mean, there are platforms that are great for sharing. Reddit, I, I personally don't do Reddit because I despise Reddit. But Reddit is, is tremendously we didn't good to. <laughs> at generating uh, huge amounts of interest in, in certain niche topics. Um, I mean, Facebook is more or less effective depending on what they're doing to their sharing algorithms in any given week. Um, but Twitter is, is, is very good at, at spreading content to, to new people. Um, and just, just keeping at it, just keep experimenting with different formats, different kinds of content, um, and targeting different groups to see who you can reach. I would just quickly echo what Andrew said in his talk, which is that it is about the content. If you make good things, they're not going to come automatically, but if you work at developing your audience, they will grow from that effort you did three years ago. And part of it is just building a brand name. Um, Astrobytes has been around long enough. We've been to almost every association meeting we can get to. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook. 
We send emails to departments all the time. We just use every channel we can think of to say, this is Astrobytes. And then as our readership develops amongst our target audience, those same people tell their friends and tell their families who check our site out. And we, we grow organically also on top of that. And so I brought some swag that you guys can take <laughs> as an example of our branding scheme uh, over there. You can't take the t-shirt, but you can take everything else. <laughs> Well, I had a lot prepared to say about the practicalities of, bro of blogging, and we didn't get to talk about it much, so I won't say anything now, but I encourage you to come talk to me during lunch if you want to know anything about the nuts and bolts. Or any of us, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah.